I'm so happy to see each of you again today, our last teaching on Job. It's been uh, a long teaching, but we've finally come to the end. I pray that you all receive something good from it. If in our notes, it's page 40, and it's also chapter 40. And if you remember, we did one through five. Uh, let's just see what these notes say. All right. The Lord answers Job. Will you instruct God? Will you reprove God? And I have there that to refer to chapter 23, one to five, I would order, I would fill, I would know. That was, those were the words that Job had used. But after the Lord spoke with him, revealed himself to him. Then he says in three to five, all right, behold, I am vile. And only God can bring this conviction. You remember the three friends as well as Elihu talk, 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 and tried to convince him that he was sinful. And that's why everything like this had happened to him. He never would budge on that at all. But once God spoke to him, revealed himself to him, all right, and God alone can bring that conviction of sin to the heart of man. He, he didn't bring conviction of sin, that sin had caused what he had been going through no god didn't do that but that he was a sinner that he was man and he should not uh you know come to god and demand things of god uh, and if you remember right the last words that he said was i will put my hand over my mouth uh in other words i i shouldn't talk anymore after hearing you. Now we're going to start with verse six. Um, here we see God is not finished yet. And he again begins to teach Job six and seven of chapter 40. Job chapter 40 verses six and seven. Then answered the Lord unto Job out of the whirlwind and said, Gird up thy loins now like a man. I will demand of thee, and declare thou unto me. Will thou also disannul my judgment? Will thou condemn me? Oops, I overread. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Will thou condemn me, that thou mayest be righteous? Okay. Now, <clears throat> here, God was still present with Job. In the midst of that strong and untamable storm, that whirlwind, God was in that whirlwind, all right? And um, he says to him, prepare yourself like a man. I will question you and you shall answer me, all right? God indicated to Job he was not yet finished. There was more to show Job and to teach him from creation. So what he's actually saying is prepare yourself for a second encounter. For I'm not done with you. Verses 8 to 14. Verses 8 to 14. Will thou also disannul my judgment? Will thou condemn me that thou mayest be righteous? Hast thou an arm like God, or canst thou thunder with a voice like him? Deck thyself now with majesty and excellency, and array thyself with glory and beauty. Cast abroad the rage of thy wrath, and behold every one that is proud, and abase him. Look on every one that is proud, and bring him low, and tread down the wicked in their place. Hide them in the dust together and bind their faces in secret. Then will I also confess unto thee that thine own right hand can save thee. Yeah, so 
would you condemn me that you might be justified? Throughout Job's questioning of God, it could be said that he seemed more concerned with the defense of his own integrity that, rather than God's. This was natural, but not good. But we have to admit Job's integrity was under harsh attack by all of them, not just the three, but uh, Elihu as well in the end was on the same side as those three in that he, he was accusing him of the fact that you need to repent. There's some terrible sin you've committed for all this terrible thing to happen to you. Um, God has demonstrated that there are many things, all right, that Job doesn't know, and therefore he was not a fit judge of God's ways. In spite of its aggressive tone, this speech is really not a contradiction of anything that Job has said. In many respects, it is very close to his own thought and endorses his sustained contention that justice must be left to God. But it brings Job to the end of his quest by convincing him that he may and must hand the whole matter over completely to God more trustingly, less fretfully, and do it without insisting that God should first answer all his questions and give him a formal acquittal. All right. God challenged Job to do these things. All right. Uh, that is adorn yourself with majesty and splendor. Look on everyone who is proud and humble him. All right. Now uh, he, he's saying, can, can you do this? Only uh, God can do things like this. And Job recognized his inability and it reminded him of his proper place before God. He said, then I will confess to you that your own right hand can save you. You know, when somebody is proud, it doesn't matter what you say to them. You can't turn them. You can't change them. That pride is there and it just takes over and hardens their heart. And so with this, God strongly brought the point to Job. Since he could not do these things that only God could do, neither could he save himself with his own right hand. In other words, salvation belongeth to the Lord. And no one can save his own soul by works of righteousness, which he has done, is doing, or can possibly do to all eternity. Without Jesus, every human spirit must have perished everlastingly. Glory to God for his unspeakable gift. That's the only reason you and I aren't on our way to hell is because we finally turned away from our own efforts and, you know, turned to Jesus and Jesus alone. Now, this thought came to me just now, and I'm remembered, I remember there's been several times when, you know, this was when my husband was still alive, and... Um, in a service, he would call the elders together to pray for someone. And he would say, Sister Seward, I want you to come up and join them in praying. And when I went there, uh, my brain was working overtime. Have I prayed enough? Have I done enough? Have I, you know, what, what I didn't realize at that time, I was still trying to work out my own salvation through my good works, through my much praying or through my whatever it might be. And I still remember that when the Lord showed me 
A, you know, my righteousness is a gift. It's given to you. You don't deserve it. It, it is not yours because you've prayed enough or you've done enough good works. And it was quite a shocker to me how long I went still going on my works, even though I believed in Jesus, but I didn't fully understand how salvation was a gift, all right? And the righteousness of God is given to us because of what Jesus did and nothing else. Amen. So these verses are presented as an aggressive challenge to Job, but they are lovingly designed to shape Job's spirit into realizing God is the only creator and the only savior there is. Uh, read verses 15 to 24. Job 40 verses 15 to 24. Behold now behemoth which I made with thee. He eateth grass as an ox. Lo now his strength is in his loins and his force is in the navel of his belly. He moveth his tail like a cedar. The sinews of his stones are wrapped together. His bones are as strong pieces of brass. His bones are like bars of iron. He is the chief of the ways of God. He that made him can make his sword to approach unto him. Surely the mountains bring him forth food, where all the beasts of the field play. He lieth under the sh shady trees in the covert of the reed and fence. The shady trees cover him with their shadow. The willows of the brook compass him about. Behold, he drinketh up a river and hasteth not. He trusteth that he can draw up Jordan into his mouth. He taketh it with his eyes. His nose pierceth through snares. <clears throat> Look now at Behemoth. All right. God gave Job a remarkable survey of the wonders of creation in Job chapter 38 and 39, including a look at many remarkable animals and their ways of doing things. Now, lastly, God gives Job a look at two remarkable creatures, Behemoth, which is the one we're dealing with now, and another one is Leviathan in the next chapter, all right? And through these two, he really speaks to Job, all right? The precise identity of this animal named Behemoth is debated. Many think God had in mind what we would call the hippopotamus. And that's what I've put here. Uh, the Lord points to Behemoth or the hippopotamus, all right? Behold it, I have made it. Notice his strength. His bones are like bars of iron. And he is not a carnivorous animal. That means he doesn't eat meat. All right. He just eats greens. He is the chief of the ways of God. And no one can approach him. He can pierce through snares. All right. God alone can order him by his word. And the sword is the word of God. God alone can provide for him because he can drink up a river uh, who can draw up Jordan. All right. Uh, he is one of the largest, strongest, and most dangerous land creatures in the world, all right? He eats grass like an ox. His power is in his stomach muscles, and God seems to rejoice in his own creation 
as he describes the wonder of this remarkable animal, noting its strength, its size, its appetite, and its habits. The picture is very clear to us. If Job cannot contend with this fellow creature, how could he ever contend with the God who created the behemoth? All right, we're going to continue now uh, over to chapter Forty-one. Just give me time to find myself here. Now he's going to go. Uh, this chapter 41 is about God, Job, and Leviathan. All right. Contending with Leviathan. So... Would you read the first seven verses for us? Job 41 verses 1 to 7. Canst thou draw out Leviathan with an hook, or his tongue with a cord which thou lettest down? Canst thou put an hook into his nose, or bore his jaw through with a thorn? Will he make many supplications unto thee? Will he speak soft words unto thee? Will he make a covenant with thee? Will thou take him for a servant forever? Will thou play with him as with a bird? Or will thou bind him for thy maidens? Shall the companions make a banquet of him? Shall they part him among the merchants? Canst thou fill his skin with barbed irons or his head with fish spears? Okay. I think go ahead and finish uh, all 10 verses like our book says. Verse 8. Lay thine hand upon him. Remember the battle do no more. Behold, the hope of him is in vain. Shall not one be cast down even at the sight of him? None is so fierce that dare stir him up. Who then is able to stand before me? Who hath prevented me that I should repay him? Whatsoever is under the whole heaven is mine. So after the discussion of behemoth in Job 40, at the very end of the chapter, God called Job to consider another fearful monster whose name is Leviathan. This creature was first mentioned in Job 3, 8. Would you read that to us? Job 3, verse 8. Let them curse it that curse the day who are ready to raise up their mourning. I, I, I think they've written the wrong verse there. Anyways, Job, in that context, considered how Sailors and fishermen would curse the threatening Leviathan, and with the same passion, he cursed the day of his birth. Usually, Leviathan is considered to be a mythical sea monster or dragon that terrorized sailors and fishermen. But in the context of Job 41, God does not seem to consider Leviathan to be mythical at all, all right? Others consider him nothing more than a mighty crocodile. The name Leviathan means twisting one and is also used in other interesting places in scripture. Let's see a few of those. Psalm 74 Verses 12 to 14. Psalm 74, verses 12 to 14. For God is my king of old, working salvation in the midst of the earth. Thou didst divide the sea by thy strength. Thou breakest the heads of the dragons in the waters. Thou breakest the heads of Leviathan in pieces and gave us him to be meat to the people inhabiting the wilderness. 
So here, uh, Leviathan is referred to as a sea serpent and that God broke the head of Leviathan long ago, perhaps at creation. Yes, because I really believe that this Leviathan is another, it, the spiritual name for him is Satan. All right. Um, Psalms 104, verse 26. Psalm 104, verse 26. There go the ships. There is that Leviathan whom thou hast made to play therein. All right. And uh, Isaiah 27, 1. Isaiah 27, verse 1. In that day, the Lord with his saw and great and strong sword shall punish Leviathan, the piercing serpent, even Leviathan, that crooked serpent, and he shall slay the dragon that is in the sea. Uh, definitely. Uh, you know, there's some things God uses um, creatures that are there to describe, and it very easily could be that he's using the crocodile, uh, you know, and the ways that he does in the natural, but it, it is pointing to um, Satan, all right, because it tells of the future defeat of Leviathan and associating it with a twisted serpent, all right, and that God is going to bring him to an end, all right. Isaiah 51, verse 9. Isaiah 51, verse 9. Awake, awake, put on strength, O arm of the Lord. Awake as in the ancient days, in the generations of old. Art thou not it that hath cut Rahab and wounded the dragon? All right. And so here, it. we're not going to read it, but Psalms 89 8 to 10 also speaks of a serpent associated with the sea that God defeated as a demonstration of his great strength and identifies this serpent with the name Rahab, meaning proud one. And we know that Satan was the proud one. All right. And through his proud, uh, through his pride, rather, uh, he let sin come into his life and through his desires to be like God. All right. Job 26, uh, 12 to 13 also refers, all right, to God's piercing defeat of a fleeing serpent associated with the sea. Would you read that for us? Job 26, 12 to 13. Job 26 verses 12 to 13. He divideth the sea with his power, and by his understanding he smiteth through the proud. By his spirit he hath garnished the heavens, his hand hath formed the crooked serpent. Yeah. So e even though Satan in the beginning was made to be the highest of all created beings because of his ambitious nature, wanting to be equal to God, in fact, wanting to be above God, all right, and the pride that entered in because of his beauty and the way that it was God that created him. God made him those things. God gave it to him but he let it go to his head. And so uh, when we re read that, we see here, uh, it refers to God's piercing defeat of a fleeing serpent associated with the sea. So here he says, um, can you put a reed through his nose? Can you pierce his jaw with a hook? God's point with this description of Leviathan is to show Job 
just how powerless he is against this creature. There's nothing that Job can do against this mighty monster. This makes the association between Leviathan, obviously some dragon type creature, even if it were in this context, only a mighty crocodile and Satan even more interesting. Satan is often represented as a dragon or a serpent in Genesis 3, Revelation 12 and 13. Therefore, Leviathan may be another serpent-like manifestation of Satan. All right. Well, I definitely believe that. All right. Um, even as Job was powerless against Leviathan, as all men are, so he was also powerless against an unleashed Satan that set against him. Only God could defeat Leviathan and Satan. Satan may be typified here by behemoth and Leviathan. All right. The one is the a land uh, creature and the other is a sea creature. And be that as it may, the question left with Job was this, canst thou? He was called to recognize his own impetus, impotence in many directions. And at the same time, to a remembrance of what God can do. God can do what no one else can do. We can know all about them. We can talk all about them. But are we able to deal with them? Are we able to, yeah, not unless God gives the power. And we know when Jesus rose from the dead and then later told them, he said, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. And I send you forth. And I give you power over all the power of the enemy. Amen. So as we turn to God, all right, uh, and as we turn to him and recognize that through him, we're able to do anything as long as we're walking in the ways of God. All right. Um, we've read eight already, but I, we're going to read from verses 8 to 11. If mankind can't overpower Leviathan, it can't hope to overpower God. All right. Job read 41, for us 8 through 11. Job 41 verses 8 to 11. Lay thine hand upon him. Remember the battle. Do no more. Behold, the hope of him is in vain. Shall not one be cast down even at the sight of him? None is so fierce that dare stir him up. Who then is able to stand before me? Who hath prevented me that I should repay him? Whatsoever is under the whole heaven is mine. All right. Uh Job could not hope to defeat Leviathan. It was simply beyond his power to do so. So the logical point is made. If Job cannot contend with Leviathan or even with Satan, whom Leviathan represented, how could he ever hope to stand against the God who made and masters Leviathan? This was another effective way of setting Job in his proper place. Well, you know, Job, I don't believe, was standing against God. He was just, uh, in fact, he knew he couldn't challenge God. So all he was crying out for was a mediator and a lawsuit where it would all be a legal thing and somebody to talk on his behalf to ask God questions, all right? But all of this now has 
caused him to realize God has not forsaken him and how great God is. By the time God finished describing all of this, all right, he, he said, who then is able to stand against me? The logical point is made, if Job cannot contend, all right, how can he stand against God? All right. Having now said and largely proved that man could not contend with God in power, he now adds that he cannot do it in justice because God oweth him nothing, nor is in any ways obliged to him. There is a second also important point that God himself was master over Leviathan. Everything under heaven is mine. By telling of his dominion over Behemoth and Leviathan, the Lord is illustrating what he said in chapter 40, verse 8 to 14. He is celebrating his moral triumph over the forces of evil. Satan, the accuser, has been proved wrong, though Job does not know it. The author and the reader see the entire picture that Job and his friends never knew, all right? That God is over uh, Satan and he has defeated him even in his accusation of Job because Job never did what he claimed he would do. He said, if you just let me touch him, touch his body, give him terrible sickness, as well as all that he had done in chapter one, removing all the natural belongings, riches, wealth, family, so forth. He said, he will surely curse you. But he never, got, he never. He wanted to be able to speak to God. He wanted to be able to know that God was still there for him because he hadn't felt him or had any any proof outwardly through feelings or whatever it might be that uh, God was still with him and for him. All right. Um, let's go to verses 12 to 17. He's going to give a description of Leviathan. Verse 12. I will not conceal his parts, nor his power, nor his comely proportion. Who can discover the face of his garment? Or who can come to him with his double bridle? Who can open the doors of his face? His teeth are terrible round about. His scales are his pride, shut up together as with a closed seal. One is so near to another that no air can come between them. They are joined one to another. They stick together that they cannot be sundered. So when it says, I will not conceal his limbs, his mighty power or his graceful proportions, to strengthen the point made in the previous section that Job cannot stand against Leviathan so he could not hope to stand against God, the Lord will now describe in greater detail the might and the glory of this creature. Who can remove his outer court, coat? His terrible teeth all around, rows of scales, join one to another. This description of Leviathan, especially with the rough armor-like scaly skin and the terrible teeth all around, makes some believe that whatever Leviathan is, in other uh, biblical and mythical here God had in mind 
a mighty crocodile. The description sounds like a terrible crocodile. All right. Like I told you, God many times uses, just like in the very beginning, he used a serpent to show the wiliness, the deception. All right. And this beginning serpent used to stand up on his feet. And only after Satan used that serpent to beguile Adam and Eve, his punishment was that he had to go flat. And uh, that poor creature that allowed Satan to use it no longer could stand upright like a human being, but had to go flat on his stomach. So God does use uh, the natural animals to picture things so that we get, you know, like his teeth, you know, the rows of teeth that are there is showing it's a creature that wants to devour, that wants to eat up. He's not a playful creature. All right. Um, 18 to 21. Verses 18 to 21. By his, by his sneezings, a light doth shine, and his eyes are like the eyelids of the morning. Out of his mouth go burning lamps, and sparks of fire leap out. Out of his nostrils goeth smoke, as out of a seething pot or cauldron. His breath kindleth coals, and a flame goeth out of his mouth. <clears throat> All right, this description here of Leviathan seems to go far beyond that of a crocodile because no crocodile has smoke coming out of his nostrils, fire coming out. All right. <clears throat> God had in mind much more than what we know of as the crocodile. There's enough about it that can be used to give us a picture uh, of the idea, all right? But when it says smoke goes out of his nostrils and a fl flame out of his mouth, this seems to be much more of what we would think of as a dragon. Curiously, all right, the dragon motive is common across many cultures and lands and may point to the actual existence of some creature of this type uh, in prehistory? Well, I, I don't think so. I think here the Lord is describing the devil. He's describing a demonic uh, creature, all right, where when he breathes, you know, the fire of hell, because it says our tongue is set on by the fire of hell. So he has affected mankind in a great way. He has torn apart and downed mankind who was going to like take the place. Uh, he had been created the highest of all creation and now God is wanting to create a human being. Let's make him in our likeness, in our image. And, you know, whoa, he could see here that this guy is going to be taking my place. And he, you know, his pride, his arrogance, uh, the jealousy, the envy, uh, he wanted to destroy that creature, all right? Um, okay, let's go to verses 22 to 34. This is talking about the might of Leviathan. Verses 22 to 34. 
In his neck remaineth strength, and sorrow is turned into joy before him. The flakes of his flesh are joined together. They are firm in themselves. They cannot be moved. His heart is as firm as a stone, yea, as hard as a piece of the nether millstone. When he raiseth up himself, the mighty are afraid. By reason of breakings, they purify themselves. The sword of him that layeth at him cannot hold. The spear, the dart, nor the habergeon. He esteemeth iron as straw and brass as rotten wood. The arrow cannot make him flee. Sling stones are turned with him into stubble. Darts are counted as stubble. He laugheth at the shaking of a spear. Sharp stones are under him. He spreadeth sharp pointed things upon the mire. He maketh the deep to boil like a pot. He maketh the sea like a pot of ointment. He maketh a path to shine after him. One would think the deep to be hoary. Upon earth there is not his like, who is made without fear. He beholdeth all high things. He is a king over all the children of pride. Yeah, right there when you read that, the king over all the children of pride. Definitely, he is talking about Satan, all right? He says strength dwells in his neck. In this last extended description of Leviathan, God spoke in terms that more closely connected the concept of Leviathan with Satan. It could be said of Satan as well as Leviathan, but if not more so of Satan, they are strong, all right? Strength dwells in his neck. They are cruel and entertained by sorrow. Sorrow dances before him. Really, Satan enjoys to see people suffer and to, to bring them down. I don't know if you've ever seen, but there are pictures every once in a while that come on Facebook that of people that have been addicted to drugs, all right? And it shows before, in other words, what they were under addiction and their faces are just tormented and horrid and grotesque and then shows them after they came to Jesus and what they are after Jesus gives them new life, new hope and breaks that addiction and gives them a nature of love and they just, whether they're men or whether they're women, the, the change is so different. Uh, under satanic influence, they are brought to the lowest, the most decrepit, uh, you know, position and doing things that they would never think of doing otherwise but coming to Jesus how they are way beyond totally changed you can't believe a person's physical features could change you know from that ugly hard look to the beautiful smile and glow of Jesus all right so Satan just loves to have people suffer they they strongly defended all right the folds of his flesh are joined together they are firm on him and cannot be moved his heart is as hard as stone they are unsympathetic and hard of heart when he raises himself up the mighty are afraid the they cause the mighty to fear. Though the sword reaches him, it's to no avail. He laughs at the threat of javelins. They cannot be successfully attacked. 
all right he under his undersides are like sharp hot serves they have very few vulnerable spots on earth there's nothing like him they have no worthy adversaries on earth showing what was said um and how we can better understand it here all right he is king over all the children of pride they are filled with pride this also means that the description of behemoth in the previous chapter may also be a representation of the strength and seeming confidence that the apparently unassailable adversary has. The use of these two names, Behemoth and Leviathan, is a poetic repetition, just as Psalm 74 refers to the breaking of the heads of the monster and the heads of Leviathan. All right. Uh, while it's true that Satan is never named outside of the prologue in the book of Job, this does not mean that the Lord never deals with him. He deals with him here in the form of Leviathan, describing him to Job with the same sort of symbolic picture language that he uses in Revelation. He is king over all the children of pride. This description of Leviathan, especially at this point, is so like that of Satan that we may fairly suppose that God here was indicating to Job not only his great might and Job's vulnerability before Satan, but also alluding to Satan's role in Job's great crises. God called Job to consider these unconquerable beasts who each in their own way were examples of Satan and his power. In this, God allowed Job to consider the fact he could not stand before the power of Satan without God having empowered him. Job thought he was all alone through his ordeal. Indeed, he felt he was alone, yet this was God's way of saying that he was not alone, because if he were, he would have crumbled before the power of Leviathan and Behemoth. But it was God that helped him in his spirit, man, to maintain, though he did other things and spoke unadvisedly with his lips, yet his spirit was strong that he never ever accused God. All right. Um, God ends his words to Job without ever telling him the story behind the story. Job was left ignorant about the contest between God and Satan that prompted this whole crisis, though perhaps God later told him. Though Job did not know the whole story, God did tell him of his great victory over Leviathan or Satan, giving Job assurance for the past, the present, and for the future. It was important that God did not tell Job the reasons why. Then Job can be a continuing comfort and inspiration, an example to those who suffer without an explanation. Once again, we emphasize that if the specific an ultimate reason for his suffering had been revealed to Job, even at this point, the value of the account as a comfort to others who must suffer in ignorance 
would have been diminished if not canceled completely. Okay, that is the end. All right. Um, let's go to our page, page 41. 18 to 24. The features in fur more than the crocodile by his kneesings, a light shine, kneesings, sneezings, kissings, any interpretation. My, that's my <laughs> interpretation. Hissing. Uh, light shines through his eyes. Out of his mouth goes fire, lamps of fire, sparks of fire leap out. Out of his nostrils go smoke as a seething pot, as a cauldron. His breath is so hot, causes coals to burn. Flame goes out of his mouth. He is a hard, he is hard hearted like a millstone. This creature, all right, 25 to 33, Leviathan's power and strength described. When he rises up, even the mighty are fearful. Weapons are powerless against him. The sword, the spear, the dart, iron, brass are like straw and rotten wood. Arrows are worthless. Sling stones and darts are alike stubble against him. When he moves, he makes the deep or the sea to boil like a pot, like a pot of ointment. He makes a path to shine after him. Who on earth can compare to him? He is made without fear. He doesn't know the meaning of fear. Verse 34, Leviathan is a type of Satan. He is a king over all the children of pride. He is high-minded, beholds all high things, arrogant, haughty, proud. The definition of Le Leviathan, a wreathed animal, i.e., a serpent, especially the crocodile or some large sea monster. Figuratively, the constellation of the dragon, also as a symbol of Babylon. Another word for it is mourning, which is a symbol of death. That's my thought. Scriptures referring to Leviathan. Psalms. 74, 13, and 14. We've read all these, so we're going to just read what's under it. God alone can deal with him. God's power is greater. God is able to break the heads, representing wisdom, leadership, direction. All right. Those are all some of the heads of Satan, all right, because definitely he has wisdom, all right, but it's fallen wisdom, and it's wisdom to know how to do sinful things and how to manipulate people and so forth, all right. Uh, 27 1 Leviathan, God will judge him with the power of his word, God will punish him that piercing serpent, that inflictor of pain and destruction, the crooked serpent, the deceiver, the seducer, the perverse one. God will destroy him in the day of his judgment. In Ezekiel 29, verse 3, he's called the great dragon representing the king of this world. Now we're going to go to uh, the last chapter. I think this is a very good, I don't know how we ended up here 
exactly right before. Um, yeah, it, this is very good. So we will come back at um, 10 minutes past 10. And of course, when we finish chapter 42, all right, uh, we're going to close no matter what time it is, because that's the end. Okay. <clears throat> okay. We're going to come to our last chapter. Chapter 42. All right. And this chapter is giving Job's repentance and restoration. We're going to divide this. Our, my book has one to six, but we're going to take one to three first. Then we're going to do four to six. Okay. Verses. One to three. Verses one to three. Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that thou canst do everything and that no thought can be withholden from thee. Who is he that hideth counsel without knowledge? Therefore have I uttered that I understood not, things too wonderful for me, which I knew not. Yes, I know you can do everything. This wonderful statement from Job was obviously connected to the impressive display of the power and might of God over creation, but it was also connected to the comfort that the sense of the presence of God brought to Job. God indeed could do everything, including bring, bringing comfort and assurance to Job, even when Job still did not understand the origin or meaning of his crises and that no purpose of yours can be withheld from you. The God who can master behemoth and Leviathan can also accomplish every purpose in Job's life, including the mysterious meaning behind the twists and turns. I have uttered what I did not understand. Job said many sad, and imprudent things, both in his agonized cry of Job 3 and in the bitter and contentious debate with his friends. At times, he doubted the goodness of God and his righteous judgment in the world. At times, he doubted, doubted if there was anything good in this life or in the life beyond. Now Job has come full circle back to a state of humble contentment with not knowing the answers to the questions that were occasioned by his crises and his companions. Job felt that he had spoken concerning the Lord in the main true. And the Lord himself said to Job's friends, you have not spoken of me the thing that is right, as my servant Job hath. But under a sense of the divine presence, Job felt that even when he had spoken aright, he had spoken beyond his own proper knowledge, uttering speech whose depths of meaning he could not himself fathom. That was a quote from Spurgeon. Let's read verses four to six. Here I beseech thee, and I will speak. I will demand of thee, and declare thou unto me. I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now mine eye seeth thee. Wherefore, I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. Listen, please, and let me speak. Before Job seemed to want to challenge God, especially in Job chapter 31, in a very confrontational way, 
now after his wonderful revelation of God, he respectfully asks God for the right to speak. I've heard you by the hearing of the ear, but now mine eye sees you. Um, this reminds us that the most powerful aspect of Job's encounter with God was not primarily what God said, but God's simple, loving, powerful presence with Job that changed him most profoundly. I think he was comparing the way I knew you before is because he he really knew God as far as knowing what was expected of him, knowing what God's words said and so forth. So he's comparing. Now it's like, wow, I've seen you with my very eyes. I, I see you. You're so clear. You're so real. Uh, before, the way I knew you was like, I heard somebody tell me about you. All right, this room, um, seeing God, not with his literal eye, but in a way very literally real. It gave Job what he so wanted. He wanted to know that God was with him in his crises. And now he can sense his presence. He feels his presence. He's been changed by and touched by the revelation knowledge of God. All right. This wonderful presence of God has humbled Job. We should not assume that what Job knew of God was necessarily false. Yet each fresh and deeper revelation of God has a brightness that makes the previous experience of God seem rather pale. What he had just experienced was so real that it made his previous experiences almost seem unreal. And yet we know that it, it wasn't because God accepted him and claimed him to be, you know, without any kind of uh, he was blameless and, and before God. Um, the verb translate, oh, no, therefore I abhor myself. It's important to understand each phrase of this statement of Job's. It would seem to be the normal conviction of sin that even a saint like Job senses in the presence of God. Yet there is good evidence that Job, with this statement, was really formally retracting his previous statements made in ignorance because the verb translated, I despise myself, could be rendered, I reject what I said. Um, the Hebrew word literally means, all right, to retract, to repudiate. I retract all that has been said. I repudiate the position I have taken up, all right? Job could be expressing regret at his foolish words uttered hastily and in ignorance. It was what he says, I repent in dust and ashes. It was right for Job to repent. He had done nothing to invite the crises that came into his life. And the reasons for that crisis were rooted in the contention between God and Satan as recorded in Job 1 and 2. Yet he did have to repent of his wrong words, his wrong attitude after the crises, both for excessively giving in to despair in Job chapter 3 
and for his unwise and intemperate speech as he contended with his companions. It's important to note that Job did not give in to his friends and admit they had been right all along. That simply was not true. The sins Job repented of here were both general sins, which are common to all men, which seemed all the darker in the presence of God, yet were not the cause of the catastrophe that came into his life. They were sins committed after the catastrophe came. What did Job have to repent of? In his sermon, Job Among the Ashes, written by Charles Spurgeon, actually suggests several things. Job repented of the terrible curse that he pronounced on the day of his birth. Job repented of his desire to die. Job repented of his complaints against and challenges to God. Job repented of his despair. Job repented that his statements had been a darkening of wisdom by words without knowledge and that he spoke beyond his knowledge and ability to know. One might say that these words of Job, words of humble repentance and submission before God for sins that were greatly provoked, sins that come from the godly and not from the wicked. These words that contain no curse of God whatsoever. These words ended the contest between God and Satan and demonstrated that the victory belonged to God and to Job. God's confidence in Job's faith was completely vindicated Job is vindicated in a faith in God's goodness that has survived a terrible deprivation and indeed grown in scope, unsupported by Israel's historical creed or the mighty acts of God, unsupported by life in the covenant community unsupported by cult institutions, unsupported by revealed knowledge from the prophets, unsupported by tradition and contradicted by experience. Next to Jesus, Job must surely be the greatest believer in the whole Bible. That's a commentator called Anderson that wrote that. Simply put, without anger toward him, God allowed Job to suffer in order to humiliate the accuser and provided support to countless sufferers who would follow in Job's footsteps. And this was now accomplished. All right, read from verse seven to nine. Verses seven to nine. And it was so that after the Lord had spoken these words unto Job, the Lord said to Eliphaz the Temanite, my wrath is kindled against thee and against thy two friends. For ye have not spoken of me the thing that is right, as my servant Job has. Therefore, take unto you now seven bullocks and seven rams, and go to my servant Job, and offer up for yourselves a burnt offering. And my servant Job shall pray for you, for him will I accept, lest I deal with you after your folly, 
in that ye have not spoken of me the thing which is right, like my servant Job. So Eliphaz the Temanite and Bildad the Shuhite and Zophar the Nemethite went and did according as the Lord commanded them. The Lord also accepted Job. All right. Um, we missed out a verse up there in uh, verses 1 to 6. Can, can you see um, the last one, E? All right. I abhor or hate myself. Uh, we, we learned, which I also learned today for the first time, all right, that that doesn't really mean that he hates himself, but he was retracting, sees himself as undone before God. He humbles himself before God, and true godly sorrow takes place. Would you read for us what that true godly sorrow is? 2 Corinthians 7, 10. 2 Corinthians 7, verse 10. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. The sorrow of the world is you're sorry you got caught. You're sorry because uh, you're exposed for what you did. It's not to change. And here he totally is changed. Now, uh, going down to seven and eight, God speaks to Eliphaz, all right, as the elder of the three men as the representative, as the spokesman, as the responsible one of those three. He tells him, my wrath is kindled against you and against your two friends. It doesn't mention Elihu for good or for bad. All right. Um, the reason for God's anger is you have not spoken of me that which is right as my servant Job did. God recognizes Job here and owns him as his servant, all right, and accepts his confession and his profession of faith, all right. Um, God rebuked Job's three companions. The friends of Job spoke many general principles that in their setting have great wisdom. But the problem was in Job's circumstance, their principles of wisdom did not apply. They presented God as angry and judgmental against Job when he was not. And this displeased God. It displeased God so much that he specifically repeated the charge in Job 42, 8. Would you read that again for us? Verse 8. Therefore, take unto you now seven bullocks and seven rams, and go to my servant Job, and offer up for yourselves a burnt offering, and my servant Job shall pray for you. For him will I accept, lest I deal with you after your folly, in that ye have not spoken of me the thing which is right, like my servant Job. Yeah. He actually uses that term three different times where he calls him uh, my servant, Job. All right. And if you turn the page to page 44, all right, and at the top of the page, uh, God's command to Eliphaz was offer up a burnt offering for yourselves seven books. This is the largest offering. You know, they had three sizes of offerings. Um, 
for the rich and that went for people that were priests and, and princes and rulers all right and then uh that that was a bullet that was the largest ram i mean the largest offering then the next was for people that you know lambs but for the poor all right it was doves turtle doves and that's how we know that jesus family was poor because when they offered it was two turtle doves all right so we know that the family he was born in was a poor family uh he was not born in a rich man's family so that he could better understand the poor if, if, all right so these three men were supposed to be wise men they were uh, they're supposed to really know god all right that's why god told them to bring the largest offering seven for perfection which represented christ's perfection and seven rams for total consecration and trespass against the Lord. And they had to ask Job to pray for them because he's, God said, I will accept Job. I'll accept his prayer. You know, they had accused Job. They had downed him. They tore him apart limb from limb. All right. And uh, now suddenly they have to go and, you know, eat humble pie, if we can say that, all right, and ask Job to pray for them on behalf of them, to intercede on their behalf. Uh, because he said, you come, I won't accept. I won't accept the way you talked about me. I won't accept your prayer. And so they needed an intercessor. I'm telling you, you talk, talk about being humiliated and downed, all right? Um, it, it was also a testing to Job, all right? And because when they came to ask him if he was holding anything against them, he would have refused and said, you think you're so smart. You think you're so clever. Uh, you rip me apart. You didn't care how I felt. You just accused me and downed me. And, you know, you go, go yourself. You know God so well, go yourself. But had he done that, he would have hurt himself. And this is what I've told many people. We need to forgive no matter what they've done, no matter how they've hurt us. It's not for their sake. It's for your own sake. Because if you won't forgive, God can't forgive you. And so no matter what people have done, it's not as bad as you and I as mankind have done to the Lord and God was willing to forgive us. Isn't that right? So, um, just a moment here. God's rebuke of Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar was at the same time an explicit vindication of Job. I tell you, he never gave a reason why Job, this had happened to him, but he called Job my servant. And what you, and I still remember the first time that I taught Job, I was so confused, studying, studying, studying. And before I went into my class, I cried out to God. I said, how do I go about this whole book anyways? And the Lord gave me this verse and said, you teach it like this. All right. Uh, and, and that is that 
you did not, these three did not say the right things about God the way that Job did. You teach it from that angle. And it just made things so much easier because, yes, they said some things that were right, but they weren't right in what they were accusing Job of. And they were accusing God of punishing Job, you see. And he wasn't punishing Job. And so um, when he says, Yet God still could say of him here, God's rebuke of Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar was at the same time an explicit vindication of Job. It was true that in his frustration, stubbornness, and misery, Job said things he had to repent of. Yet God could still say of him, as my servant Job has, putting forth Job, as an example of one who spoke what was right. And, and, you know, as I said, he said it three times. So it was Father, Son, and Holy Spirit that said this about Job. All right. Um, so I think that's the, uh, verse, just a moment here. Seven to nine. We, you read verse nine, right? Yes. Yeah. So Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar went and did as the Lord commanded them, for the Lord had accepted Job. The friends of Job were accepted for Job's sake, because the Lord had accepted Job. God made Job a mediator to his friends. In fact, he became like almost an example of Jesus, how he suffered, how he took lies and whatnot. And yet, if you remember when he was on the cross, he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they say. They knew what they were saying in the natural, but spiritually they did not understand that they were downing the, the son of God who had never sinned in his life. And yet they were making him be nailed to the cross, which means to be made a, a curse. All right. But he did not hold that against them. The pain, the agony that he went through, he said, Lord, forgive them. They know not what they say. This must have been a very humbling and instructive experience for the friends, but a happy and healing experience for Job. These men did not say, no, we will not go to Job. They did not attempt to justify themselves. Uh, they had heard God's voice the whole time he was speaking to Job. His voice was being heard. Uh, so when God spoke to them, it wasn't, oh, they got a shock. No, they had been hearing him speak to Job. And now... Um, they did exactly what God told them to. And in so doing, they did a grand and noble thing. They took the only chance of getting to know God. They had attempted to restore Job by philosophy. They had failed. He was now to restore them by prayer. The bands of his own captivity were broken, moreover, in the activity of prayer on behalf of others. As soon as he was willing and started praying for them, he was definitely set free, set free at that very moment, all right? 
he was permitted to take a noble revenge. I am sure the only one he desired when he became the means of bringing them back to God. God would not hear them, he said, for they had spoken so wrongly of his servant Job. And now Job is set to be a mediator or an intercessor on their behalf. Thus was the contempt poured upon thus the contempt that was poured upon the patriarch turned into honor that was written by Spurgeon okay let's read verses 10 to 11 verses 10 to 11 and the Lord turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends also the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Then came there unto him all his brethren, and all his sisters, and all they that had been of his acquaintance before, and did eat bread with him in his house. And they bemoaned him, and comforted him over all the evil that the Lord had brought upon him. Every man also gave him a piece of money, and every one an earring of gold. All right. Now, it, it says here, the Lord turned the captivity of Job when, notice I underline that, when he prayed for his friends. All right. Not before, but when. The moment he was willing to be like Jesus and be a true mediator, and he prayed for them, all right, for his friends. It was a proof of humility. It was a proof of love and forgiveness. And it says here, God was good enough to restore Job's wealth to him. Even Job ne never asked for this. Job's agony was always more rooted in the more spiritual aspects of his crises, much more than the material. Yet once the spiritual was resolved, God restored the material as well. He gave him twice as much as he had before. He also gave him restoration of relationships, close relatives, all his former acquaintances, restoration of fellowship. They ate with him. They bemoaned and comforted him. And the restoration of wealth, all right? Um, God, okay. It does not say God turned the poverty of Job, please. It had nothing to do with that. Uh, nor the health of Job, nor his friendships. Rather, literally, he turned the captivity. He had been under satanic captivity. And because Satan had the upper hand and had the control of him, Satan was calling the shots. Uh, the people turned people against him, caused all these terrible um, misfortunes to happen where he lost his animals, lost his wealth, lost his children, everything. It was Satan had the upper hand. God allowed it. It was a testing, all right, whether or not, that, though Job didn't know it, Job was being tested and Satan was uh, you know, claiming that he would end up cursing God and dying. It says here, a man may be poor, sick, friendless without being captive. Yet until Job had a revelation of God, until he humbled himself before God, until he brought atonement to his friends and prayed for them, he was still in captivity. This happened after Job's relationship with his friends was restored. 
all right, when he prayed for his friends. It would have been a weak restoration if Job's relationship with Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar remained as contentious and bitter as it was during their debate. Then all his brothers and all his sisters, all right, came and ate food at his house. Job was once an outcast, even from his own family. If you go back to um, Job 19, 13 to 14, would you read that for us? Job 19, 13 to 14. Fourteen, yes. He hath put my brethren far from me, and mine acquaintance are verily estranged from me. My kinsfolk have failed, and my familiar friends have forgotten me. Yeah, so that tells what it was like, all right? But now these relationships were restored, all right? Uh, as soon as that captivity was broken, Suddenly, people's attitudes about him changed, all right? And so um, they came and they consoled him and they comforted him for all the adversity that the Lord had brought upon him. You know, they still thought it was God. Well, in a way, God allowed it to happen, but it was not God. It was Satan. They didn't see the difference between this, all right? This was even after his losses were restored, his captivity was released. It's worth dwelling on the fact that even when everything is set right, Job still feels the hurt of his losses and needs human comfort for them. They also gave him generous gifts, a piece of silver, and each a ring of gold, probably more to honor his greatness than to make it, partly to make up his former losses and partly as a testimony of their honorable respect to him. 12 to 17. Verses 12 to 17. So the Lord blessed the latter end of Job more than his beginning, for he had 14,000 sheep and 6,000 camels and a thousand yoke of oxen and a thousand she asses. He had also seven sons and three daughters, and he called the name of the first Jemima and the name of the second Keziah and the name of the third Karen Hapak, and in all the land were no women found so fair as the daughters of Job, and their father gave them inheritance among their brethren. After this lived Job an hundred and forty years, and saw his sons and his sons' sons, even four generations. So Job died, being old and full of days. Now, when it says that the Lord blessed the latter days of Job more than his beginning, in the beginning of the story, uh, we find that uh, Job was a blessed and godly man. At the end of the book of Job, we find a man more blessed and more godly. In the end, all the attack of Satan served to make Job a more blessed and a more godly man. Uh, our sorrows, this is what Spurgeon said, our sorrows shall have an end when God has gotten his end in them. In other words, whatever we go through, when God has received what he purposed when he allowed those things to come, all right, the end in the case of Job were these. Satan might be defeated, foiled with his own weapons, 
blasted in his hopes when he had everything his own way. All right. That was uh, Spurgeon that said that. Job had doubled his possessions under the blessing of God and doubled his children also. If you go to the beginning and see what it says in chapter one, how many uh, oxen he had, how many sheep he had, how many goats he had, and then you go to the end, it's exactly twice the amount. Twice the amount. Don't ask me where they all came from. Suddenly they were, in a moment of time, they were destroyed. But God made sure he got them all back, plus the double of it. All right. And we can also see as this Mason, who is a uh, commentator, suggests this chapter as an example of the work of revival, all right? This work that was done in Job, all right, is an example of the work of revival. God's people are convicted of their sin. I abhor myself. God's people are broken and repentant. I repent in dust and ashes. God speaks to hard hearts and they listen. The Lord said to Eliphaz, God's people pray for others and God answers. Job shall pray for you. God's people obey God. Eliphaz, Bildad, Zophar went and did as the Lord commanded them. God's people are united and jubilant. All his brothers and sisters came to him and ate food with him. God's people are blessed. The Lord blessed. It says he also had seven sons and three daughters. Nothing could replace the children Job so tragically lost in Job 1. Yet these 10 children were of true consolation. It's also, you know, and what I want us to know is because he had prayed for them, Every time they met together, he offered up sacrifices for when they, yes, they all died in one day, but they all went to heaven because he was a priest in his own home and interceded on their behalf and prayed on their behalf. So he had 10 up there in heaven and now God gives him 10 more, seven sons and three daughters, all right? The daughters of Job were also uniquely blessed, noted as being beautiful and having an inheritance among their brothers. You know, that reminds me that under the new covenant, it says in Christ, there's no male or female. And in those olden days, Women just didn't get to inherit, all right? It went to the men. And uh, if they inherited anything, it was through their husband. But in the new covenant, it, it's, it's the same, all right? No male or female. We're all the same in Christ. And so it says here, uh, there's no doubt some connection between Job's godly conduct as a family man and this blessing on his daughters. The names of the daughters of Job are of some interest, all right? Jemima means turtle dove or day bright. Keziah, cinnamon or cassia which is a fragrant scent that is offered in offering unto the Lord, all right? Uh, Karen Hapuk, a jar of eye paint or horn of beauty. The idea was she was so beautiful, she needed no cosmetics. 
her natural beauty just shone out as if she had everything that was needful. And Job lived 140 years after all of this. And here, remember, of course, he repented of it, that he had wanted to die. And he thought that the time to die had come. All right. But now he saw his children and grandchildren for four generations. All right. Job's life was ended long and blessed. He was well rewarded as a warrior who won a great battle for God's glory. The greatest, the most important purposes were accomplished by this trial. Job became a much better man than he ever was before. The dispensations of God's providence were illustrated and justified. Satan's devices were unmasked, patience crowned and rewarded, the church of God greatly enriched by having bequeathed to it the vast treasury of divine truth, which is found in the book of Job. In this great book, there is no solution of problems. There is a great revelation. It is that God may call men into fellowship with himself through suffering and that the strength of the human soul is ever that of the knowledge of God. We are not all like Job, but we all have Job's God. Though we have never risen to Job's wealth, nor probably ever will, nor will we probably ever sink to Job's poverty. Yet there is the same God above us. If we be high and the same God with his everlasting arms beneath us, if we be brought low. And what the Lord did for Job, he will do for us, not precisely in the same form, but in the same spirit, and with the same design. That's Charles Spurgeon that said that. I pray, I hope and pray that you have all been blessed by this book and that you better understand it now than you did when you first started, all right? Um, next time you read it, you can read it with a little bit more understanding and picture yourself in Job's position, all right? And try not to be like those three friends and even Elihu, who though he claimed he wanted to take uh, the place of God and speak like God, he had the same philosophy as they did, that the reason Job lost everything. So just remember that is not so. Just because things go bad doesn't necessarily mean we have sinned. As long as you walk with God, talk with him, we might have bad experiences. We might have good experiences. But keep your eyes on the Lord and God will oversee everything and bring everything into its right perspective because he is a good God and he's an all powerful God and he has control over everything. So let's bow our heads as I pray for a spirit of the living God. I thank you, Lord, for this book. And I thank you for the lessons that it has taught us that we are not to accuse, we're not to condemn people, that even as Jesus said in the New Testament, we need to take the beam out of our own eye before we try to take the moat out of somebody else's eye. We need to keep ourselves right before God 
and instead of accusing people, pray for them, pray for them, love them, and above all, forgive them. Forgive them for whatever they've done wrong, because only then can God forgive us. Thank you, Jesus. We give you praise and glory. Thank you for each and every one that has attended these classes and for each of these that have read for us each time. Thank you, Lord. In thy name, I pray. Amen. Thank you, Monica. God bless you. And God bless each of you for being faithful and hope to see you on Saturday when we go back to the book of Ezekiel. And next Tuesday, we will start the book of Psalms. All right. God bless you.